Thank you for your time. My name is Big Tula, and this is Shooting from the Hip. Hey, Slim, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Not bad, thanks. Okay, so this episode will probably air in the new year, so let me get that out of the way. Happy New Year, even though we're recording in 2022. Uh, but I just wanted to say that to everybody who takes the time, all three of you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for showing up. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to tackle the subject of the placebo effect and the nocebo effect. Um, so just to be clear, um, the information that we get is, is pretty much uh, easily, easily acquired by anybody. You just have to have a willingness to, to look into the subject itself. And you'd be surprised at how much information there is uh, on the placebo effect and how well uh, documented it is. It's been around since the beginning of medicine. Now having said all that, um, we're going to dive into it in, in, more, in more, again, in the vein of, of what we do here, which is we're just a couple of talking heads and this is a thought exercise and we're exploring the, the information and don't believe anything that I tell you or anyone else for that matter, right? Okay, so having said all that, Let's start. Uh, I'm gonna just I'm gonna quickly just read some uh, uh, s uh, s the definition for it, and and then we can sort of start picking it apart. Okay, does that work for you, Slim? Yeah, that's good. Okay, placebo effect and nocebo effect. Okay, so the the idea is that uh, your brain can convince your body a fake treatment is the real thing, the so-called placebo effect, and thus uh, stimulate healing. Uh, has been around for like millennia, right? Now the nocebo effect is just the opposite. It's the reverse of the placebo that you can convince yourself that you're ill and then your body will react as though it's ill. Actually, it'll, it'll become ill. So it's not react, it's not acting like it's ill. It'll, you'll induce illness. So, so, so the two of them are, uh, are really intimately uh, related and again, well, uh, well understood and seen throughout uh, history. So speaking of history, the first use of the placebo effect in English in the 13th century referring to Vespers. Vespers in the evening song, evening prayers for the dead in the Roman Catholic Church. The effects are, are psychobiological events. As, that's what they refer to as a placebo. Defined as inert substance that provokes some kind of benefit. So nocebo is the inert substance that causes harm, right? So we just clarified that. Psychology uh, is the science of the mind, but in any real sense, the mind cannot exist without the body uh, in which it resides. So, so that much, again, we all understand that. that like, I think people even casually, commonly understand that like you're not just your body or your mind. Those two things are very intimately connected and related, right? So, um, so studying the relationship, studying relationships between mind and body can greatly inform our understanding of psychology, uh, which is uh, uh, um, this psychobiology uh, describes the interaction between biological systems and behavior. Psychobiologists research how cognition, what we are thinking, and mood, how we are feeling, combine to create biological events. So striving to understand how psychological and biological connections shape the human experience provides psychobiology with a unique perspective. Okay, so I think that I think we can we can certainly start there. So it's that much is clear, right? So that you're not you're your entirely integrated system and that mind and body, even though we, again, it's just for the ease of being able to talk to, to, to in language to talk about them, we identify them as being separate. The problem is that we start to believe that they're two separate things. And clearly the placebo effect demonstrates that they're not, they're one thing. They're an inter completely integrated with each other. And so affect one and has a profound effect on the other. Right, so would you agree, disagree with that? Does that seem reasonable? Yeah, it seems reasonable. Okay, so, and, and maybe that's the point, right? That all of this, ultimately, that you as a human being, you could exercise some kind of significant influence in your mental health and your physical health by tackling each, each of those 
uh, each of those aspects of self. So if you put some effort into, into mind, it can have a positive effect on body. And if you put some uh, po positive effort into body, it has a positive effect on the mind. Um, so that relationship, I think, uh, you know, well understood, right? Uh, we understand diet and exercise, how much of a positive effect they can have on psychology. Well, and now we see why. It's because the two are so closely related, right? Um, so uh, having said that, now imagine the average state of the average person. You think about, think about your own life. So is a placebo effect at work then or the nocebo effect at work in day to day. Like here, like in the course of medicine and stuff like that, it's this outlier that's produced healing or remission from severe diseases or, or symptoms of disease. Uh, and that's again, well understood. But is it at work in, in us, the individuals, the average person, day in and day out? I think it would be because technically when you consume something, you know, it produces that effect. Like if you have very uh, heavy foods, you're going to feel heavy. You're going to be right. right. So then it's going to affect it. like your mind is going to what also then demonstrate that heaviness. That heaviness will carry over from the body into the mind. Right. If you exercise, you might be able to alleviate some issues. And then and it might produce relief mentally. So again, this is kind of stuff that most people do casually understand, right? That you can profoundly affect your physical uh, or your psychological uh, state of being by, by addressing or doing something to your physical state of being. And they work in reverse. Now off camera, before we started recording, uh, we just started getting into it and I wanted to save it for the, for the camera like so that because it was really interesting territory that we were walking into. So I asked Slim, I said to him, I go, when you wake up first thing in the morning, um, <clears throat> what, where does your mind go initially? And this is a question that you, the person listening to this, might want to consider this. Like, where does your mind go? Do you, do you immediately go into... Um, the negative or less than pleasant thoughts that, that you're obsessing over before you went to sleep or from the day before or do you move on to or, or do you move on to something different and and your response was oh I I would suggest pausing and thinking about this first before I answer <laughs> but yeah no I didn't even think about that before but it seems like you have a moment and then all those processes bring back the issues of the last day even if they're not affecting you realistically today but here's the thing they are affecting you right because your mind's on them. right so then so so this this is a good time then to bring in mental rehearsal so I'm gonna read something quickly about mental rehearsal and we'll bring it back to to what we were talking about so this idea of mental rehearsal it, it um, it involves imagined or mental practice of performing a task as opposed to the act, to actually doing it. So think about like those negative thoughts. You're thinking about things that happened, how you would have chosen to do them differently, or how you, angry or upset you are over the way that they played out, right? And 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 then you 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 end up being wrapped up in in your own emotional content from that event from the day before or even further back in your past so it's so you're drawing all these all these things that have occurred and now are actually in the past you're bringing them into the present so as as defined as mental rehearsal isn't that isn't that what you're doing you're, you're reliving that so you're rehearsing that same event over and over again and if the event was unpleasant then you're reliving the unpleasantness of that event in the present moment so why is it so important like it's it, mental rehearsal like it's it's something that's well studied by psychologists and employed by athletes because they know that like it has a real profound effect on athletic performance if they take the time to just visualize what they're doing and really that's what we're talking about like uh, I, being able to uh, pre-prepare yourself for something. Well, you can use it as a technique for controlling stress, but 
the way most of us use it unconsciously. Remember, that's because you take the time yeah, you, that you recognize that, that um, you don't recognize that you're doing it. You're just doing it. And, it's, and, it, and you're pl employing the mental rehearsal negatively. But it's a technique that can also liberate you from stress and anxiety. And that's how it's used when it's employed like in, 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 uh, by psychologists and stuff. Uh, people like that in, in, in those disciplines. It's how they apply it to try and relieve stress by like being able to envision yourself um, confronting stressful situations and dealing with them successfully instead of being overwhelmed by them or, or having a negative backlash. And going back to what we were saying about to what I was saying, sorry, about the experience that you had in the past and how, how once you f initially wake up in the morning, what was your, I, you said something that was really interesting. What's the first thing you said? You, oh, uh, first thing, check your phone. Right, of course. right. And, yeah. But then it's where does your mind go after that, right? So once you kind of like addressed the stuff like that you're, you know, whatever possible communications there might have been between other people and yourself while you, during the rest period, now you're, you're trying to confront that. But once that moment's passed and now you're, you're starting the day, you're into the day, um, here's the question. How much of the past events are you bringing forward? And, and if you are, that's a form of mental rehearsal. So then, the, and the mental rehearsal, remember, it's the experience. So part of it is like you're thinking about it and then feeling it. So you're reliving the emotional experience. That you have a sense, a feeling of, of that negative experience. So ah, now here's where we tie it into the placebo or the nocebo effect. So how much of that then is feeding into the placebo or the nocebo. How much of that is influencing? Um, and remember, it's all in your, it's all a product of the, of the mind. So an undisciplined mind would, would just go there and, and then they would ruminate on all those negative experiences because those are the ones that you tend to draw our attention to. Right, so you're thinking about the negative interactions with other people and and your and relationships because that's a part of any kind of interaction with another person that they're not always perfect. Sometimes they're problematic, and sometimes they cause a lot of dare I say the word melodrama. Right, and so it's, the drama induces a, 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 an emotional response that you're kind of re-experiencing. So having said that, so then. If that produces, like, so if, so if you, we could call that a depressed mental state or an anxious mental state or a stressed mental state, then how's that affecting the body? But it's inducing the body to enter a stressed or negative physical state. So then the two of them start feeding into each other. And it's unproductive because now what it's leading to is potentially... Uh, when you think about the nocebo effect, is it potentially leading to like an illness because you can't you can't manage what you're experiencing and thinking about the th the things that happened in the past because you keep re reliving them in the present, right? So can, is that relatable at all? And does it, any of what I've just said kind of like does it resonate with you in any real way? Does that make sense? Yeah, I have specific things I want to add to that. Okay, go ahead, please do. Like when you first wake up and you have that moment of peace and then your voice, or the voice in your head starts going, there's this problem solving method that just comes up because that's what we do as humans. We think about things. But we don't know the difference. Be our brain doesn't know the difference between experiencing something and thinking about something. They both have that action of changing your physical state once you think about it. So like this idea of having a placebo effect where you can wake up and say to yourself, um, in th this is like huge into any, uh, I would say like philosophy or religious, uh, it's okay. Try and just try and get it out. <laughs> yeah. It's this idea of waking up and having acceptance which, or like, that's a very strange way to be this idea of if there's a real issue and it's still causing you harm, you can accept it and still have a better day. That's very interesting. <clears throat> to me. Um, I, 
I, I don't disagree. Um, I would even add to that that um, the nervous system doesn't know the difference. So if you are ruminating about the past and re-experiencing the emotions, even if it's on a low simmer, you're not experiencing them intensely, perhaps you don't need to for them to be having a negative effect. So now we've established that, that because the nervous system can't tell the difference between what you're thinking and what you're what you're thinking, the feelings that you're thinking is producing, it doesn't know the difference like in, in the sense that, that it's actually occur happening to you or it's just a product of your thinking. Um, you can therefore be able to break that pattern, interrupt it, and then pursue uh, a state of, of uh, a mental state where now what you are doing is since your nervous system doesn't know any better, you start thinking and feeling the the best that you you can for the in that moment that you that that you're having. So first thing in the morning or within the first few hours of getting up, that where you now you take you have enough discipline to be able to one have the intention of feeling like that your life's not empty, it's not lacking, that you're, that, that you're a whole and that you're a complete person and that you're worthy. Those are your thoughts. And then, then you take it the next step. Then you feel those. Now, I can't tell you how to feel that, right? But you have to, you have, to have a physical sensation of, of that thought. So if you're thinking that you're like you're greatness or that you're good and you're, you're whole and you're complete, and you feel it, you have to feel it deep down the corner of your being, then is that the means by which you can induce the placebo effect? Like, and so the placebo is the positive one, right? We're, we're now that mental intention, because it's the thought, and your nervous system doesn't know the difference. So if, if this is what you're thinking, and then you go out of your way to physically feel good, elated, ec ecstatic, then then your nervous system doesn't know any better and it starts feeling good. You start feeling, feeling it across the board. Would you, would, could you see that as being very possible considering that the reverse is true? Yeah, I've accidentally stumbled on this. I, you know, you want to have a good day, put on a song that you really enjoy, like a song that you can get into. And, like, that you feel. It's reaffirming. It will help you stay in that state of like, I'm great. I'm having a good day. It helps you stay in there. Okay, so so then, it re then what else would be required? So let me say you're now you're using something external to like to, so you have the sensation, the feeling of feeling good and positive. So um, maybe the 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 mental state of being present. So you have the wherewithal that you're present. You're in the current moment, and even though. Um, all those great things that you envision aren't actually happening to you, but you can you can imagine them, and so in the in the imagination of them you can experience them, and then and in the experience of them that like you feel it you feel that thing so it means being present enough to recognize that here I have I can I'm in charge right so that so that actually I don't want to make it sound like that but there's no other way to say this so then. So then that thinking portion of who you are that that's tied to the default mode network of the brain, like it's the way the brain structures that run automatically without you, um, you interrupt them, right? By by overriding them and in, in using something that'll that induces like something strong and positive, a, a sense of real of yourself and in the most healthiest way, and then you do that to override the negativity. Um, so then, so then it becomes a practice. So then it has to be something that you, you can't just do it once and then it, it, it happens. You have to, you have to almost continually throughout the waking day, exercise that kind of discipline and, and then go through that. You have the intention like that in your mind that you're rich, you're abundant, you're whole, you're all the things that you, that you the best things that you envision in life, you're already that. And then you feel it, and I can't tell you how to feel it. Like, although Slim, I think, had a good idea. You start with some music, right? Find music that lifts you up and that you feel in your bones. Not just music that you, not songs that you're just hearing. Go, that's all. Oh, that's kind of quaint stuff that where you feel the music. 
Yeah, it can't be hypothetical. It can't be this fake it till you make it. It's it's weird. You literally have to inhibit or embody that part of you. That's not there yet. Excellent, excellent way to say that. So you become the embodiment of 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 that feeling of feeling good, of 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 that highest expression of yourself. You experience it. Even though it's in, in, in actual terms or in practical terms, it may not actually be occurring. Yeah, but the interesting thing, like you, when you're saying the default mode network can be interrupted with this just strong intent, and like this. But it's a combination of like the thinking and the experience, the sensation yeah. of like. It has to be reaffirmed. Right. By and, reality. Right. So then, and then, so then in doing that, then does that elevate your physical state? So then. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing I was going to bring up is that the the baseline that people assume, like, I'm always going to go back to that. No, you can change that. You can reset it to something. As much degree. as you want. Yeah, yeah. So, like, if you're stressed out, you're not going to be stressed forever. You can do things to make it better today, and that carries over to tomorrow. Right. And so it doesn't mean that you don't experience. It's not being diluted. It, here's the difference, right? It's It's training yourself to recognize when you're slipping into, like, um, the thinking about the past and projecting on the future in a negative way, like when you're ruminating and, and, and you're going through like those negative things. That's always going to be a part of the experience. But the question becomes, how long are you going to spend there? I hate saying this because it sounds so like, uh, just like, like I'm pushing or pointing down at people like, do better, do better. But it's so weird. You have to ignore it. You have to accept it. And then from there, you have to make the world the better place you want to see. It sounds so cliche. Okay, so then, so then, now what we're talking about is that you experience the fact of of being all that you envision yourself to be, without the cause. So you don't have the cause for. So we bypass the cause. You go, you go. I because most of us are waiting for that thing to fall in your lap so that you can start feeling good. Well, what if? If the, that's the way that the placebo effect works, that what you do is you start feeling good first, thinking good first, then it produces uh, the cause that would that you would that you would in a linear kind of way that you need the cause first and then you have the effect. We start with the effect first. That you, the person, have that kind of potency, that kind of power, right? That power that exists in you, and that. If people can sit there and convince themselves that they are not ill, and then for their body to present and without the illness, then the average person might be able to do just the same. And then so then you liberate yourself from that shitty feeling, from the from from the negative kind of thing that you that that we we all struggle with, and we all go through this. Like it, uh, at some point, everybody who's listening to this. Uh, think about your own past experiences and think about how often you found yourself in a downward spiral and then you just made it infinitely worse by the th thoughts that were that fed into that downward spiral and then how physically it made you made you feel shitty like so now you, you know that all that negative thinking and produced a negative physical Kind of, kind of uh, sensation, and the only way to break from that was you had to do something to actually, to actually like break from that so that you could have some relief, so you could move on to some other kind of torturous uh, sensations. <laughs> yeah, in life, there's going to be things that stress you out, and they should stress you out, but you shouldn't stay in that. If right, the, if you're spending your time self defeating, like this idea of oh, I feel bad, and I don't even deserve to feel better. You're never gonna win. Well, again, it, 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 there's a lot of that. Like where it, where we start, you get so comfortable and feeling horrible that the normal state then becomes this like the state of the victim. Like because it, you, you, here's the strange thing: it it speaks to how adaptable we are. In that you end up adapting to that and that becoming the norm, and then you becoming comfortable with feeling shitty. Yeah. Right, like, or feeling, having a horrible sen sense of self and a horrible physical sensation of self, and then everything's just compounded further. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. When does it end? Well, it ends when you interrupt it. So then that means you actively taking a stand, a <laughs> stand up to yourself, right?
catch yourself in your own bullshit. Right, right. And it, and here's the thing: you'll never be free of that, but of that negative part of yourself. But what you can do is you can minimize how much influence it has on you, and you can minimize how often it becomes because it's about how much time you spend in that. What what if it's a short period of time? You just feel like shit for like a few moments, and then you. You already know. You pause. You take a moment. You do whatever you need to do. Take a few quick breaths. Give yourself a slap in the face. Whatever. Like it's good to feel the negativity, but to dwell on it, it's like the issue. Right, because because that's what induces the nocebo effect, right? Because ultimately, that's what this episode's about: the placebo nocebo, right? And we've already established that mental rehearsal could be could play a critical uh, component. In, in the way those things act on you as a human being, right? So, so what if you could? What if that's the way by which you could induce the placebo effect? So every, every time you're feeling like shit or you're physically not feeling well, that if you bring yourself to that, first you think in that evolved, elated kind of ecstatic kind of thoughts, and then you physically start experiencing that. And again, I can't tell you how that, that's what that sensation will feel like. Although you may discover it in the course of meditation. Some people do it. Because it's really about just quieting the mind. Letting the mind become still. And then you're able to then hear. You can, you can induce whatever thought you want. So you can take it. You can take it down a negative road, or you can take it down, uh, up up a positive run. It's entirely up to you. But you're the one who's in the driver's seat. But most of us act like like we have no. We're di completely disempowered. We're not at the driver's seat. Yeah. There's somebody else driving the bus. Actually, it's you. If it feels like somebody else is driving the bus. Treat yourself like you are that third person. Say to yourself, "Hey, cut that." Shit. I'm the driver. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Did, you don't don't allow. Again, it's it's part of being able to re reaffirm or reassert that you're in charge of you. <laughs> that it's not it's not this byproduct of uh, the nervous system or like the random thought generator, which is uh, a, a product of uh, the default mode network of the brain. That's just that's just the nervous system doing what it's supposed to do. You're the awareness behind it. So as the awareness behind it can intercede. It can make decisions. You're the awareness. If, but if you get caught up in that part of you which, you, which typically is tied to the way, to our identity of ourselves. Remember, we talked about this and being, being entirely subjective or entirely objective. You end up losing. It's all about balance. So, so that identity could can be part of the problem especially when you start favoring the, those subjective thoughts thinking that that they're just as important or more important than anyone else's right they're just thoughts they're meaningless so approach them in that way and then you're liberated from them right you don't have to be hampered by them it doesn't mean you're not going to feel horrible it just means that you don't have to spend the day feeling like shit as opposed to maybe five or ten minutes right that the, so that's the options in terms of how you pra how, how that practically plays out in your life it's momentary ne uh, uh, feelings of discomfort uh, versus you training to have uh, uh, to continually try and experience the richness of everything to have appreciation and gratitude for the life that you're living so that's something that you train yourself to do but most of us convinced ourselves I'll feel that when I get that great job or when I get that great girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever that we that we put it on something material when it has nothing to do with the things that are going on around you materially and that maybe if you focus that energy on and discipline on cultivating an elated state that you'll draw those things to you without actively having to seek them but the moment you start Obsessing and thinking about that, you drive that shit away from you. Does that seem unreasonable? So maybe that okay. So then, if it's not unreasonable, maybe that's how the placebo and the nocebo work. Because ultimately, we're just talking about mental rehearsal. <laughs> like so, at the end of the day, at the bottom of the uh, of everything that we've discussed so far, it, in the mental rehearsal, we convince ourselves. Uh, 
we convince ourselves of the, the state of our being, mental and physical. So if that's true, then, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think that maybe that's suggestive that you might have you might have the ability to influence your life in a profound way, in a way that you never imagined. Either that or I'm completely full of shit. Right? But ask yourself, does it seem unreasonable? Is the reasoning flawed? If it is, then it is. I don't but, think the reasoning is flawed at all. Okay, well, but we, you know, now here's, here's a fair, here's a, here's a fair question. Is that like, is that because you have a bias, right? It could be. Right, it might. Personally, I think it works because I've had experiences where I was like, I need to be more positive and I chose to be more positive while I was still shitty, feeling shitty. And it did work out. I, I thought, hey, I could be positive force for my friends, or I could just be there for them. Or, or just be for yourself, right? Like, yeah, like ima it, imagine it, if you loved yourself enough to be there for yourself. So, okay, interesting. I, thank you very much. Great segue. So then maybe it's about loving yourself. So maybe that's the experience that you, that physical sensation. So if you're looking for love, you'll never find it. But if you, without somebody being in your life, if you experience love, that like you love yourself in your entirety and the wholeness of who you are, you're, you, you just have love for you and you physically like have the sensation of that, then maybe you draw it to you. I'm just saying. Uh, part of that love isn't like you give yourself candy because you deserve it, you're a good boy. <laughs> It's more like you accept like the negativity, the positive, right? Like, all of it in its entirety, and you're okay with with the good and the bad, and you don't you you uh, you no longer are um, are seeking out one and uh, you know uh, uh, adverse or or uh, avoiding the other. Yeah. Right. That you go here. They're both part of the experience, and so it's just learning to be okay, not to fear them. So again, think about the emotions that we're talking about now. Like, so how powerful is that fear? And if it drives like a negative mental state, how negatively that plays out in your physical state. So if so, then if that's true, then the reverse is then you f to feel love for yourself. And then if you, and then again, when I say that, not in a romantic, silly kind of you know, um, lovey-dovey kind of way, but where, where you think about love as being total acceptance and you being okay with everything as it is. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't weigh on you. It's still shitty, but you don't have to, you don't have to bear the weight of it. It's like, it's like when someone says, you're only human. It's like, yeah, we're all kind of bad. Yeah, we are. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's the absolute absolute truth right so so that makes for so that's made for some pretty interesting thoughts right like uh, um, there have um, there's been some interesting um, I, I got some stuff here I'd like to dive into with regards to the placebo effect um, there are some people are like well it hasn't been proven it's not real or there's some there's some some uh, Medical professionals will refer to it as quackery, right? Um, but it's uh, it's it's funny. Like um, according to Harvard, uh, science has found that under the right circumstances, placebo can ha can be just as effective as traditional treatments. So again, it it there's there's some validation to the idea that you know mind over matter. And then the question becomes, how do you access it? So we we discussed that I think pretty thoroughly. How do you access it, right? So you access it through your thinking and through uh, applying your emotions. But the most positive emotions that you can have and the most positive thinking that you can present, right? And that's that's the rehearsal. That's the mental rehearsal, right? So if, if so, if the re reverse is a negative mental rehearsal, you can have a positive one. So don't. Don't pour all your energy into the negative one. Pour, pour actively pour the energy into the positive mental rehearsal. And so, so what? So, um, so in terms of uh, the placebo effect, 
Um, there's a double blind study. So what that means is both participants and experiment experimenters are blinded. And the triple blind is the assignment is hidden not only from the participants and the experimenters, but also from the researchers analyzing the data. So, okay, what does that mean? So when they're testing, when they're testing new, we're going to move into pharmacology for a moment. So when they're testing new medicines and stuff, they test it against the placebo effect. And there's two ways to do it. So the double blind is where uh, the participant and the experimenters don't know what's going on. And the triple blind is that they don't even know what the experiment is. And they don't know who's getting the placebo and who's getting, uh, getting the actual medication. Right, and this is how they test the the um, the effectiveness of the medication. They test it against the power of mind over matter. I go, and and yet, and then yet, it's you know, there's still people out there who refer to it as uh, quackery, right? So it's insane to think of it as quackery if we're using it to this extent. Where we, this is how we do our data plots. We compare it to some woo woo magic. Then why are we using the woo woo magic? I, I'm like, well, I mean, then maybe that's the way to go. Shouldn't, it, what's funny is how aware uh, the medical community is of the placebo effect and how little, little long-term studies, because it's been around since, well, since the beginning of medicine, right? The fact that they rely on it to do these uh, data points kind of makes me think, this is very conspiratorial, but why wouldn't they check it out? Like, it's so interesting. Well, I think what I think about what it would do for it would change the face of medicine and pharmacology, because you go like to what extent do you even need meds, like other than more basic things like so I hate to I hate to refer to but like herbal herb herbal remedies in conjunction with the placebo effect might be more potent than actual medicines. Look, drug companies must show that their new drugs work better than the placebo before the drugs are approved. Right. Like, come on! Like, uh, a placebo has been sh uh, has uh, have been shown to affect a range of health conditions. Positive effects reduce pain, anti-depression uh, effects, anti-anxiety, eighty-five percent reduction in coughs, erectile dysfunction, IBS, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy. So, if you can induce the placebo effect, these range of uh, illnesses and symptomology. You could, you could be able to do from the comfort of your bedroom or living room or, you know, sitting in your backyard. But the question becomes like, again, how do we induce it? Like, and so even though we we jumped right into that, or right in the opening, uh, I, I, again, we can't confirm that that's actually the way you do it. We don't know, right? So that's the problem. And so we're speculating because. It makes for an interesting conversation, and this is a topic that's utterly fascinating. The idea that that you could profoundly improve your physical and mental health by inducing this this effect that where now you override your body's function so that it heals itself. I like got without with and again we have there's a long history of snake oil salesmen and people offering. Uh, cures, cure-alls, and stuff like that. They, they, they've been going on since, again, first probably as long as the placebo effect's been at work. But here's the thing, right? It, it's something that's regularly used to gauge gauge the effectiveness of, of mainstream medicine. So, so then maybe there's more to it. Maybe it's the thing that should be explored more thoroughly. At least out of curiosity, it should be explored because of all the side effects you get from uh, medications. I've heard this, I'm not going to say it's a sad stone. Not sad, right? But yeah. But when you take a pill, every effect you have is a side effect. The main effect is just the most potent one. And Wait, then they and which is, it yeah, and, and, and most of them are designed just to address the symptoms and, and not to the root cause. Right. So how many of these things are just made to have a general effect, which generally works, and then there's a list of side effects. And... Uh, other issues they might not even understand because some medicines or uh, uh, go ahead. In some pharmacological cases, you'll see that uh, there's not enough studies done to actually uh, 
use certain drugs. I forget what the heart medication was, but that was 2011. Like yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, so okay, so there's, again, there's a history of that as well, right? Like unnecessary uh, or medicines that haven't been, haven't been, uh, haven't produced enough. Uh, um, Solid data. Right, say. to prove that they, they do what they, what, what they're, what, what they claim that they're supposed to do. Um, so it makes me start to think then about like, when we think about the placebo and uh, here, I found this super interesting. It's a little uh, factoid. For if, um, placebo interventions vary in strength depending on many factors. So I didn't even know that. So that if you give people, like say if you give uh, somebody two tablets, it works better than a single tablet. Or a capsule works stronger than a tablet. So if you get like a tablet, like an aspirin, and it's and it's a salt tablet, a capsule or is more convincing to the person who's who's taking it, right? Uh, and the, <laughs> here's the wildest thing: size of the pill actually can affect, uh, you know, um, the placebo effect. Uh, or saline injection instead of instead of taking a tablet, like where they just inject saline into you, and you think you're getting it's being and a medicine's being administered, and then it produces this positive effect, but Again, it doesn't. It doesn't explain why it only happens to a certain percentage of people. So I think again, we can go back to what we were talking about in the opening that that maybe it's because it produces an elated, elated or ecstatic, you know, I don't want to use the word ecstasy, but like a high, high emotional, a very spirited and positive emotional sensation. Right, that somehow that this is oh, it's gonna. Res I feel so great, and that in that feeling great, it's the thing that undoes the, the you know the, the the negative symptomology and stuff. Right? Um, and, and I, here's another interesting I, I thing I found out: that the placebo effect varies between cultures. What? Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. So there's some regions on the world, some cultures, where if if they, when they apply the placebo effect um, in terms of like addressing certain symptoms, it's more effective using one form of the placebo effect in one country than it is in another country. So I could give a pill to somebody and it wouldn't work as efficiently as it would say in, in Chile and it wouldn't work as say as effectively as it say, would say for somebody in Germany, depending on the condition, right? right. Like it's dependent on the condition that they're experiencing. Say I go to a, a smaller area and uh, these people believe in shamanistic beliefs. If I give them like herbal medicine, they might be more prone to believe that than this weird, strange-looking soul. I, 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 I may be. So then, so then, so this may be then something interesting. So then, so this, because ultimately we're talking about the nervous system then responding to stimuli, and it doesn't. And the, and the form of the stimuli. Um, uh, it, it comes in in what we like the expectation that we have in terms of what medicine is that'll fix us that heal us make us feel better the, there it, it, it's something that's kind of programmed into us especially if you like here you brought up in in North America Canada US that you have a certain expectation that like here that the doctor whatever the doctor's prescribing can address not your you know your issue and resolve it for you and for some of us, they believe it so wholeheartedly that guess what? It does way more than what than what it, it's supposed to do. But then, then that doesn't speak to the drug nearly as much as it does to the stimulation to the nervous system. So here's the key. So which part of the nervous system are we talking about? The autonomic nervous system. So it's the peripheral nervous system that regulates involuntary uh, physiology, physiological processes like. Uh, um, uh, your heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, digestion, sexual arousal. Um, so, and it's it's broken down into like three sections. So it's the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and the enteric. Now the enteric has to do with like uh, your waste waste management and stuff like that. So that's not not um, a focus here. But the parasympathetic and the sympathetic are. So remember what we said about mental rehearsal why it's so important and that the nervous system can't tell the difference between your negative 
thoughts or positive thoughts and the actual experiencing of something negative or positive. It doesn't know. It just responds to the stimuli. Well, it has two ways of responding. So the parasympathetic nervous system of the PSNS is uh, responsible for uh, rest and digest or feed and breed is the way that they refer to it, right? And the activities that occur when the body is at rest, especially after eating, including sexual arousal, salivation, uh, lacrimination, like uh, tears, uh, urination, digestion, defecation. It's all part of like that rusting phase and stuff like that. And in that rusting phase, your body is not under duress. All right, so it's responding in in a completely de-stressed kind of way. So uh, what in, and you can artificially induce the parasympathetic response through breath. So if you intentionally focus on a slow breath rate, so it's lowering your breath rate. Remember we talked about this when we talked about uh, breath work and meditation. So nasal breathing, breathing in and out exclusively through, through your nose, slowing down your rate of breathing. Suddenly that, that minimizes any kind of stress response, which is the fight or flight, which is a sympathetic nervous system. It's the other side of the autonomic nervous system. So when you're in that state, um, the, the sympathetic nervous system is responding. When you're in that, it's, it's referred to as the fight or flight. It increases like their rate of breathing. It stops all the resting functions because it's preparing for you to either flee or, or have a physical confrontation. The, the drawback to that is, is it dumps all these stress hormones into your system, stuff that we might be effective in those really extreme situations. But, but it, your body responds the same way if, you're, if, you're, if it has a, a sympathetic nervous system response and it's not to that ex, kind of an extreme kind of an event. Like, you know, it's not a life-threatening event. It's just you stressing out. It, it goes into this fight or flight mode. So that, what does that mean? It means all these stress hormones are getting dumped into your system and are proliferating in your system uh, because you know you're you're having anxiety over like not being able to keep up at work or whatever, so you're having this incredibly negative response uh, physically, and then so what it does because of all the stress hormones being dumped into your system now it changes the chemistry of the brain, so now the brain starts being because your physical state is 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 a negative state. That means your mental state will reflect the same thing. And you don't need that most of the time. If you, look, if you look at a bodybuilder, first thing they do, they listen to that music that gets their heart going, they go, they hyperventilate through their mouth, and then they believe they're going to lift the weight. That same system can be useful. Most of the time when you're resting, it's really, well, it dumps stress into I, you. I, I, I've had this conversation with other people who are, who's, uh, backgrounds, uh, educational backgrounds, or like anatomy and physiology, where we, we talked about um, conf physical confrontations, like uh, that you, the last thing you want is to have a sympathetic nervous system response. You don't want to go into fight or flight because that makes you reactionary. So if you're coming at it from a relaxed state, you're way more effective. Uh, you're way more pliable to what's going on, and you're and you don't get overwhelmed. Would you, yes. su would you suggest instead of hyperventilating, you just sit down and calm down? Uh, yeah. You so breathe in and out through your nose only. Slow your breathing rate, and then mental rehearsal. See it in the mind, and then feel it. It's not. Don't think about it in words. I'm going to lift the weight. <laughs> Use your imagination and envision it in your mind and then feel it, physically feel it, and then go do it. I bet you you'll find it an incredibly different experience, right? So anyway, so talking to other people who, who are, have backgrounds in anatomy and physiology and the martial arts, and we were discussing uh, physical confrontations, that the last thing you would want is to be in that heightened anxious state in a confrontation because that um, because what it does is it in, in, increases your heart rate you don't need it more than than what 
the physical activity at that moment is required. So you don't need your heart racing, which is what the stress hormones will do, right? And then your breathing becomes rapid and shallow, and which is, again, akin to panic breathing. Well, you don't want to go there. You want to have clarity of vision, clarity of mind, so you don't want to be in a sympathetic response when you're having a confrontation, right? Think about it. What's road rage? It's complete, it's you completely succumbing to the sympathetic nervous system. Stress, hormones, stuff, and then what happens? The mental state? You, you, you start having all these hostile, and again, it's, it's almost always in words, that miserable motherfucker, yeah. that bastard, you know, right? Like, right? I'm going to kill you! Or, you it's, know, a high, wait. it's a high-stress situation already, so of course someone cuts you off, you're like, I'm going to kill you! Right, ah! uh, right. And, and so then the... So then the physiology is working against you too. Is that really how you want to come at the situation? Right? So, so if that's not how you want to come at the situation, then how do you prepare yourself to deal with that? Well, then what you do is you favor a resting state. Because what does that give you? It gives you mental acuity, uh, clarity, so that you're able to see what's going on without actually being overwhelmed physiologically by it. And remember, they're not separate. So if, if this is physically going on, now your brain thinks that you're, well, rightfully so, because your body's convinced that it's under duress. Or it's the reverse. Your mind's racing because you're like, God damn, you cut me off, son of a bitch. And then now you're, and now you're inducing, and you know, this dump of stress hormones and you're physically stressed out. So it just amplifies the negativity. Right? So... So it's really important to, and most people don't even understand that there's, that this is a function of their, again, of their, of your nervous system. So who's in charge? Well, if you got in a road rage incident where you're just about to, you know, walk to the back, find whatever tool in the back, instead just think about what song you want to listen to next. Uh, no, no, no. The first question, is this, is this really how you want to, is this really the way to deal with this? You would have to think of that first before deciding how to mitigate that feeling. Right. So, so yeah. but, but if you train yourself well enough, then that's all you would require. You get to a point where you wouldn't need all the extra stuff. You might need that initially to try and right, undo all that peak stressed moment to undo it. But eventually, again, mental rehearsal. So if you practice that, like that, hey, I'm, I don't have to come at this like this. I can, I can come at this in a much more like, uh, restrained and relaxed and kind of way where and, and still acting intelligently it's not like you're gonna get walked all over but now you're you do it where you're not where you're not doing it's not becoming an intense experience any more than it already is so then so then you take something that has the potential of being like leading to like a high stress moment and you completely neutralize it before it becomes that right so so then is the placebo effect then tied into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Uh, because uh, when you're in the parasympathetic nervous system, your body reabsorbs all the stress hormones. So it undoes what it's done. And it's interesting, you can do that uh, by like effort. You Breath, know, you know breathing, I mean? yeah. breathing. <laughs> Just yeah. slow down your breathing. You can bring your happy place with you. It's not that hard if you can. Practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it's, uh, you know, I, again, I know that for some people that it might be kind of silly, but, but the reality is, is that, you know, your happy place. You're just, you're, you're just bringing this, this ease. You can come at everything from a place of ease, from a relaxed state. You can still be animated. You can still be energetic, but not. Uh, not the kind of uh, excitement where, like, you're uh, manic and you're on the verge of, like, like, uh, like lashing out because that's that's not what you want. That's what produces all those tragic kind of, you know, you have something that, like, as simple as somebody cutting you off and then it gets reduced to, like, somebody being shot. Like, and you go, do you really think the person who did that, that's what they envisioned for the day for themselves, that they, this is how they imagined that they would be dealing with uh, the, those circumstances? No, 
and I, I and I can't I can't imagine that anybody would 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 prefer a violent kind of like way of dealing with anything problematic in the especially in the course of living your life day to day in the society you live in is this is that really what you want to do do we do we really need to be hostile with each other and of course the answer is no we don't well then how do you achieve that and then in the achievement of that does that tie into your body's ability for it to heal itself right so so i so i really think that like state of mind and state of body there those are things that you can master so I'm going to go right back to the very first food for thought, self-realization, that, that maybe the goal should be for each and every one of us. Your purpose then is to master yourself. And then what it represents is the evolution of yourself. And that maybe then you'll tap into these, to these capacities that we previously, we have only glimpsed. So again, I'm speaking now to in terms of the placebo effect because we were, you know mental rehearsal we know is a real thing and that it, it plays out negatively and positively on us so so maybe then that should be that could be a driving purpose into so it gives you meaning right here what's the purpose of your life well to master myself and in the mastery of myself I end up discovering these hereto unknown capacities that are natural part of what we are because that's what the placebo effect demonstrates the fact that it exists is that here's this function it's a natural function within us uh, but we don't know how to induce it all right so it but I suspect and I can't prove it but I suspect that if if your goal was to master yourself that you that you might very well be able to to induce the placebo effect on command. Now, isn't that fascinating? Wouldn't that suddenly change reality in, but it in takes a very dedication. dramatic way? It takes a lot of dedication. Uh, it, not as much as you think. Here's That's the weird thing. I think everyone's convinced that it's this hard road traveled. It requires discipline. It requires work. But not in the, in the kind of way I think most people imagine. And I, I think it's just that you got to find the right methodology to apply, and then, and then be there, be present, and give yourself give yourself time. I think the difficulty in it would be making sure, like, it more often than not, I have to choose the right road. I don't have, like whatever method you use. You we all to, do, but but we all have to accept it being positive. Well, you can, and I, like, to be fair, I've been accused of being toxically positive, right? And Because I'm the eternal optimist, and I don't see life as being, because uh, in the state of our society, it's reduced purely to material gain. So I could see where that, in that, anyone who's, like, eternally optimistic or, or would, would favor a more positive outlook could be seen as being negative. But here's the thing. I don't walk around with my head in the clouds. I completely, I, I, I completely accept the fact that it's a, it's painful. I, ne I never get away from that fact. I'm the first one to tell people, it's painful, but you got to learn not to fear the pain because it's temporary. It doesn't last forever, right? And so those horrible things you go through, they're only horrible for so long as, as the time it was required for them to occur. But once they're gone, they're gone. Well, why do you keep reliving them then? Right? So, so then you keep having that experience. So that's suffering. So that's, you have to be clear. Make the distinction between pain and suffering. And in the suffering, maybe it produces that nocebo effect, right? Like we're now, it, it compounds the, the, sh the, the, the shitty way that you feel and makes it even more worse. And then the end result of that is it produces a negative health effect, right? Like, um, and think about it like you know how much things like just your blood pressure and uh, the state of your physiology are negatively infected and affected by that like those negative emotions and negative thoughts and we know that you're because we just talked about the autonomic nervous system it will respond in a sympathetic way that means now you're you're walking around in, in a truly stressed out not just psychologically but physiologically state 
right? Because you got all these stress hormones running through you. Your your thinking is is anxious and and stressful. So all this stuff is just making everything that you're experiencing all the worse, right? And like I said, I mean, I I find it again. I find it super curious that people would because they they they're they they're so willing to be okay with with how poor the quality of life is and they, and they keep going well if I can just do this then that will all change well let me ask you every time that you acquire something materially like you gain and make good money all you know, this stuff do those things change and the answer is no you still go through those things you're still experiencing those things so so the answer then isn't in in the material reward or gain that it's somewhere else, right? So it goes back to what we were saying in the opening that did you experience, you have this sensation of like love and that your life is full and complete and that you're whole and, and you envision it in your mind, then, you know, it's the effect without the cause, right? So then life, and then maybe what happens is life will then produce the cause further down the road. So in the past, you create the effect, <laughs> and then in the future, the cause occurs, right? So, and remember, we're, we're, again, we very wrongfully assume that, like, time moves linearly, and now we know from what physicists tell us that time's not what we experience. It's just the way we experience it. But it does its own thing, so it's, you know, it double backs on itself, it, it gets into loops, it does all sorts of things that it does. But because of our, the nature of the way we experience it, we only understand that first you have to have the cause and then you get the effect. And I'm trying to tell you that maybe the way that you, you liberate yourself physically to a degree and, maybe, and mentally is, is using mental rehearsal and then you, you envision the effect before the cause. So you have the effect first and then the cause comes after the fact. Right, so you experience the richness and wholeness, and, and 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 then it brings you the cause. Right, so so it's super weird, but uh, guess what? So's life. Right. I was gonna add, uh, if you see people with like the golden retriever personality, I think they're trying to fake it till they make it, and they don't get the benefit of this state that you're talking about. Because once you have the, or when you're trying to approach this state. You do have to look at the negative side, and you do have to accept. Yeah, it. it's because it's part of the whole. Yeah, you have right? to accept what you can from it, but remove all the wasteful emotions that are attached to it that makes you feel uh, resentful towards yourself for the future. These people with like golden retriever syndrome, like where they're just so happy and they're like, "Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go home and cry." Uh, Nobody's no, gonna no. know. Anyone who knows me personally would never accuse me of it. That's why I laughed when I when I when somebody was like, "You're toxically positive." <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, "Fuck, you really don't know me." <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it's good because you have like the posi or you have the benefits of that golden retriever. Like, you you can feel that positivity, but it's not bullshit. You're no, like, because I don't. I, I don't get. I, I don't get lost in that. I mean, I, I still function within a world where, the, you know, there's so many dynamics at work and stuff like that. But I'm I'm going like here. I have control over how this plays out, at least in terms of my part, and that's true for all of us. We all do. So here's the here's the real question. How do you want to contribute to the moment that you're experiencing? Do you want it? Do you want your influence to be a shitty negative one? Oh, can I add again? Sure. If you have a, issues with a worker or a friend or something, and you keep feeling like you're gonna have these negative experiences with them, go into it thinking that you could possibly be nice enough that they're not upset. Maybe give them a compliment. Like, it's just small things to make sure you don't get into that place. I, Maybe you still will. Um, I don't. Um... I I don't know that I subs uh, that I subscribe to that. I I think that like if you're if you're having a negative reaction with a person, uh, how you liberate yourself from it is you try to understand where they're coming from. Yes, you still have to be truthful. It can't just right. be this positive. Right. So so I don't have to like you, but I can appreciate why you're the way you are. Yeah. Take no shit. Cause no harm. Yeah, do no harm. Right. So, and I think that, that there's serious value in that and that, 
Uh, because out of the understanding, then you then you can have compassion for them. And so then instead of reacting hostily, uh, being hostile to them, you just sort of like you just avoid them. You go here, like it, you're you're you know you're gonna drag me down, and and I can't tread water for the two of us. So you know, and I, I'm of course I'm willing to help you, but I'm not carrying your weight. You right. got to carry your own weight. And if you're not willing to do it, then well, I'm not either. Right? Like, so it, again, for the integrity and the sanctity itself, you've got to be able to navigate those more negative situations. But it doesn't mean you have to be negative to get through them. You can get through them and feel good about yourself and not dump on somebody else. Because at the end of the day, if you're, if you choose to be, if, to contribute in a negative way, all you're doing is reaffirming what that asshole that you don't like, that you, what they already think. Yeah. And you and, can't die a martyr for them. Like, right, oh, they're right. so sad. I have to be yeah. here. So what you do is you go here. I'm going to give you the dignity that a stranger deserves. I, that I'm going to treat everybody in that way. That you're deserving of a certain amount of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, to, uh, to treat you in a way that, that's dignified and that you can, where you, uh, and with a certain degree of respect. Right up until you, until you start like disrespecting me. Then, then instead of angrily confronting it, say something. And then fucking get out of the way. Go, you know, you're just a time bomb. Go ahead, go blow up in someone else's face, like, right? Because that's all you can really do. So, I don't even know how that uh, this all ties into the placebo effect, but it all of this carries over. So here we go. What we're ultimately, what the placebo, if anything, talking about it, uh, what it should bring to your attention is that mind. It's mind over matter. So the mind and the reality we experience are not separate. And that the one influences the other just as much as the other influences, influences uh, um, like in this case, it would be matter over mind. So the matter being the material e experience can have a negative effect on you, which produces a negative state of mind, which then influences, uh, the uh, puts the, the material state in a negative state. So you see like it's this, it's this vicious circle. You can, you can interrupt that. And you and you can create and you can create one where there's not viciousness anymore, right? And I'm not talking about like kumbaya and holding hands and shit like that. All I mean is that where you walk through the world and and, and you're dignified, you have respect for others, respect for yourself, and you feel good about you, right? That's not you trampling on anyone. And then, if anything, you'll be prone to helping people along the way. Right, because it'll it'll just feel good to help somebody out, and again, not at the expense of yourself. Right, I'll go back to the last episode of shooting from the hip. Don't exploit and don't let yourself be exploited. It's really these are important things, and you know, damn, I ever sound preachy. <laughs> I don't know that you can talk about this stuff and not, but but at the end of the day, this is what we're. Discussing because this is the kind of conversation we all should have been having when we were 12 and 13 and we never did Right because no one ever told us uh, Anything about this stuff and then other than like get a good job or get a good education So you can get a good job you make good money and then you, you know have the perfect family and blah 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 and prepare uh, prepare for a retirement and, and have a good life Well, let me ask you how many of those people really do have a good life? And it's the very last thing you get to do. Have a good life. Why can't I start with that? Why? Why not that start? That be the beginning. I'm gonna have a good life right now. I'm not waiting for the rewards for all the effort. The good life starts here, and here, and you, and it starts here and now, right? In this moment. I think it's important to watch the aims that you have, and if you can aim for a better life, why aren't we taught about that? Like that you could be happy in it. Or at least feel satisfied, like that, that you can have, that you can live and experience life to a degree, where where you have satisfaction from moment to moment. That you, that you can feel good about the life you're living and 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 the person that you are, and that those aren't those aren't fanciful ideas. Though that they're very real and very practical ideas, because again, it produces like a very positive health effects and and mental health as well, right? So. You know, and, and in a time where all those things are like not addressed and nobody gives 
Oh, but they're written on like Christmas cards and stuff like that. <laughs> but we don't need them. I don't. Yeah, we don't need it. But I don't need the reminder once a year. Let's do it every day, every waking moment. That's your and goal. Mean it. And mean it. Yeah, absolutely mean it. Right. So, can I get a time check? Oh, dude, we're way we're past an hour, hour and ten minutes. Oh, okay. You know what? Uh, I'm there's a. I think I, I'm good for maybe another ten minutes because there's something very interesting I want to table here and I want to see how, how you respond to it uh, and who are all three of you who are listening how negatively you or positively you might take this so I often I've often thought about the the placebo in fact in in the sense of like okay so ultimately we're talking about mind over matter and the reality that you experience so the placebo effect is is, is suddenly the ability to address illness and symptomology from from illness and that if you could induce it what that might mean right and so um i've lost i don't know how else to say this other than to say it. i've lost many family members to cancer so it's prevalent in both sides of my family so um uh and i've often wondered <clears throat> about cancer in and of itself um, the idea of like how much money is tied up in the treatment of it because having having the experience of watching uh, you know family members go through it and being there with them at their side like not just in a indirect way but in a direct way to see how how um, and I don't want to speak disparagingly of medical practitioners or people I know you know they it's a it's hard enough job for them to do what they do but I find it kind of curious that um, when you think about uh, how much money cancer drugs make, for example, the sales revenue of cancer drugs have doubled among top pharmaceutical companies in the last 10 years. So in uh, 2019, they exceeded 103 billion uh, USD. So it's uh, United States dollars, right? Uh, the revenue from the sales of oncology drugs increased by 96% over the last 10 years, from 52.8 billion USD in 2010 to 103.5 billion USD in 2019. Stats Canada uh, in 2021 estimated that 229,200 Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer and 84,600 will die from that cancer, right? So I'm sorry to, to take this into a very sobering kind of direction, but like you said, I find it, I find it kind of interesting how, how, how much industry is tied up in the treatment of our health, right? And especially negative health. So uh, World Cancer Treatment Fund uh, um, cancer statistics for the uh, most common types of cancer, excluding non-melanoma skin cancer in 2020, the latest year available, there was an estimated 18.1 million cancer cases around the world in 2020. And of these, 9.3 million cases were men and 8.8 .8, uh, million uh, were women. People with cancer have been slowly increasing in recent decades. Global cancer rate is up from 0.54% to 2.64% uh, since 1990. Attributed, uh, and they attribute it to like <laughs> smoking, right? I go, people have been smoking like forever. Like, so that, that's what suddenly fed into the increase. Right. Again, not, you know, and the American Cancer Society estimated numbers of new cancer cases and deaths in 2021 were estimated at 1.9 million new cancer cases diagnosed and 608,570 cancer deaths in the United States. So, and I'm not trying to give anyone a false sense of hope or anything, but what if you could produce a spontaneous remission? And in cancer, the, the rate for spontaneous remissions is one in 60,000 to 100,000 cases. So for every 60 to 100,000 cases, there's an average of one remission, right? Spontaneous remission. There's no reason for it. They just, they just, re it just resolves itself, right? So I don't, I'm not sure if it says anything about 
cancer specifically or about the individual itself but you can suddenly see like with the, the dollar figures associated with it just just how profitable it is and there's no nice way to say this and again I don't I'm not speaking disparagingly of doctors and nurses or anybody in the tr who treats for cancer. I mean, I understand how difficult their position could be. But I've often wondered um, uh, that, and this is the part that, that might be controversial and hopefully won't, won't, be, uh, oh, won't get us in trouble. Um, I've often thought that that if we were to discover tomorrow that they could have resolved cancer decades ago and chose not to, I'm not saying that they did, I'm just saying that completely hypothetically, that if they did, that I wouldn't be surprised by the fact that, that what, they, what some people did was decided it was a good business decision not to move forward with that. And again, I'm not... I'm not accusing anybody of anything, right? To be clear, right? Because it's very important. I know that this is, uh, again, it's a difficult subject that, you, that, and I don't want to go to my way to be, be turning people ugly, right? But everything we've talked about leading up to the to the end of this conversation, it's the thing that's always, um, it's always been in the back of my mind, right? I lost a, I lost a parent to it. I've lost. A, uh, grandfather, I've lost uh, aunts, um, and, uh, so, and the likelihood is it'll probably claim some more people within within the context of my immediate family. And that's the reality of it, right? Like so, so I've often wondered, you know, like I said, it wouldn't surprise me one bit to discover that they could have resolved it in a relatively easy, benign kind of way, and they chose not to make that information available. Yeah, I'm not saying that they did. I'm just saying that if we did, if that was the suddenly came to light tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised by it, right? So again, I know I know how dangerous that is to 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 tread on on that ground. But and so so I do it. Uh, I I do it in the hopes of not inciting anyone into into being into being uh, incredibly angry. Again, I. Because I understand the loss that comes with it. Like I said, I lost a father, a grandfather, an aunt, and that's just uh, that was just in the last well, two of them very recently. Right. So, if I can add uh, again, hypothetically, uh, not calling anybody out, uh, I'm very happy that there's things set in place to help people when they really need help. I really like that we can help each other. I think fundamentally that's what we should do. I think a hundred percent. I think that's always that. It's always a preferred way of of, 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 of yeah. humans interacting with other humans. And it's very beneficial. Like, it makes you more happy when you can help somebody you deeply care about. So, but I, even even to help out a stranger, it yeah. feels just feels good. So, you know. So maybe the lesson here, if there is any, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Doing it, just finish your because you had a thought. I. Sorry, I apologize. I'm just curious. Uh, with all with all the products we consume that we may not have a strict eye on, uh, some products containing carcinogens, if we at least uh, cut down on the amount of products that we're allowed to use those, for example, if there's food with carcinogens, I'm not saying any fast food restaurant has those, but hypothetically, <laughs> If, if we at least try to cut down on these shady pra hypothetical shady practices of using cheaper quality or more addictive substances in these food or hair products or whatever, right? Even if we didn't have a cure for cancer, how much of that number was unnecessary? Like how much of that came? Uh, well, uh, 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 okay. So the honest answer is we'll never know. But but you know if if you have a cynic's eye, you might you might look at it and go maybe maybe the um maybe you could have curbed that the deaths uh that I, and and the people who became uh, aff uh, afflicted with with cancer could have been curbed maybe even significantly but but the reality is we don't know right and and it's such a profitable industry you could see why 
why you know like so much energy and effort goes into it but my what I find super curious is that the the same methodology of treatment has been going on for decades without any real significant change and so that's that's it, it just makes me kind of like again I hate to use the word suspicious but yeah maybe that would be fair to say and wouldn't it be great yeah. if if we could exercise mind over matter and then make something like cancer a thing of the past I'm again I'm not so wishy-washy to think that to think that that's an absolute but what if, what if you could it would be a good talk it would be a great day <laughs> wouldn't it be a great day All right so uh, I don't so if, if there's any any point to all of this is that you can influence your environment and your environment influences you so there there's an intimate relationship there and in that inter intimate relationship you can intercede as an individual and you can dictate the outcome based on on what you feel and and exercising your imagination mental rehearsal remember that right so in in applying those things that that you could maybe uh, exert a very positive outcome in your own mental in your own mental and physical health right so maybe there's if there's n if nothing else at least you can take that from this that that you have control over those things you can decide how you're gonna feel or how shitty you're gonna feel for how long right you can you can intercede you can step in and prevent that from being the overwhelming way uh, uh, that you that you're going to approach your own life but it requires again right a lot of uh, it requires a lot of discipline so it's not the effort that's so hard it's the discipline because you have to consistently do it it's not enough to do it once right so you're going to mentally envision it uh, you have the the imagination of it uh, and you and you the physical sensation you feel it um, and you know typically uh, the methods available to us for being able to do that are like breath work and meditation they 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 have that's where they come into play and that if you apply them in your life and then you, you mentally rehearse the best version of yourself and the best life that you have and uh, that you can have and you imagine it in your mind's eye, then, like I said, then maybe you create the effect before the cause, right? Or I'm just, or I'm just talking nonsense. It's entirely up to you to decide. But wouldn't it be amazing, right? So I think maybe we might be at the end of this one. What do you think? I think so. It was a really good one too. Yeah, I found this right. It's a subject like I've been thinking about for such a long time but I, I'm always fascinated by it because it's it's the kind of trip that you go like most of I'm surprised how little of us actually even never consider it you know once you consider some of these topics that we've gone over it makes me want to question everything well is not the point right ultimately that's the point so on that wonderful note I would just like to say question everything Thank you for your time.